Hi there, Alexi. How are you? Hello, I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine too. Thank you for joining me today. Um, can you introduce yourself a bit to the people in case? <laughs> yeah. So, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me for this uh, for this uh, podcast. So, my name is Alexei. I live in Berlin. I work at Elix Group as a lead data scientist. And uh, I actually, initially, I started my career as a software engineer. Then at some point, I decided that data science is uh, a cool thing. So I switched my career to data science. And I've been working as a data scientist full time six years. And all these six years I spent in Berlin. So I think I worked like in three companies over here. And uh, yeah, I really like the city. And uh, I also like data science. How does it, um, I'm in this for three years, I guess. I, I started learning four years ago. So what what did change in six years, in your opinion? I guess it changed drastically, right? It did, yes. So actually, like first time I heard about data science, I think it was around 2012. So then uh, this is uh, when the, the machine learning course on Coursera appeared. And this is actually when I uh, watched it. And this is when I became interested in this topic. I think one le year later, there was another course on Coursera called Data Science. It wasn't as good as the machine learning one. But uh, back then, like when it started to appear, it seemed to me like it's all about math and tra like training models and then uh, like really understanding, like deriving all these formulas and, uh, you know, really understanding the, the mathematics behind it. And when I talked to some companies, uh, I, I was working as a Java developer back then. And uh, I was talking to some, com some companies saying, hey, I'm a Java developer. I'm really interested in this kind of thing. Like, I really want to do machine learning. And they were saying, hey, but like, you, you don't even have a PhD. Like, how can you, uh, how can you work as a data scientist? Gatekeeping. Yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, that was normal back then, because all the data scientists back then, um, they uh, were uh, like everybody had PhD back then, uh, like because the in the industry, like people in the industry, they did they had no idea what they want. They just okay, like seems like a cool thing. Seems like we need some mathematics, so let's hire um, people with PhD in physics and uh, let them play with our Hadoop cluster and figure out uh, uh, what to do with uh, these people. And uh, if we go like three, four years after that, uh, around 2015, 16, the situation changed there. So PhD was no longer a requirement. And this is when I uh, also uh, became a data scientist. Uh, uh, between these two, like between working as a Java developer, I worked a bit as, uh, sorry, I studied, I got my master's, I worked a bit as a freelancer, and then I got uh, like a full-time position. This PhD requirement was no longer there. So it was possible to get hired uh, just uh, by saying, I know this stuff. But the focus was still on uh, modeling, on modeling a lot. So there would be, in many companies, there would be a separate data science team, a separate engineering team, and data scientists would uh, come up with some crazy idea, implement it, and then um, give it, uh, hand it over to the engineering department, and they will spend a lot of time figuring out what to do with that. Uh, what I see now is the focus is shifting a lot from um, from this mathematical part, from modeling to infrastructure related things. Um, I think what happened uh, over these six years is that we figured we like as a uh, as a community of people who like machine learning, we figured it out how to actually train these models. There are frameworks out there that make our life super easy. Uh, we can just take these frameworks and train a model. But now the difficult part is what happens before training the model and what happens after training the model. And this is, these are two things, data engineering and machine learning engineering. Right? So basically engineering, how do we actually put these things in production? And I think now the emphasis is more on, on this. So maybe that's why um, the, 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 the last year to 2020 was, uh, in my opinion, the year of MLOps. Like it just suddenly became so popular Everyone started talking about MLOps. I think this is the reason. So previously we uh, we were thinking about other things, 
but now like we figured it out how to train models and now we have a, another problem like how do we actually deploy it and that's why i think now we have we see so many mlop startups uh, that focus really on solving this and uh, yeah i think this is how the industry changed over this uh, Sorry for a long answer, uh, but uh, like this is what I see. Like the, the focus is shifting from the modeling part to engineering part. So data science is no longer um, it's no longer about reading papers and implementing that, but it's more about uh, taking off the shelf solution and shipping it to production. I agree, but like I mean, researchers still do their own things, mm -hmm. and um, I mean. How did people even scale when there is no production or like how did people even like construct data pipelines or, you know, do data engineering when the emphasis is wasn't there? Do they just simply have their own data, train the model somehow and then just push it and do nothing else? How did it work? So what I observed, uh, there was uh... A data science team who would uh, do these things let's say uh, they get a dump of a database get this sql file prepare uh, sorry csv file prepare this and uh, have some sort of kaggle like uh, environment where they have a csv file with uh, data that is more or less prepared and what they do is just train uh, a model and then once you have a model you handle uh, you hand this over to the engineering department and they figure out what to do and usually it takes a lot of time Okay, uh, let's say if you um, use R for training a model, now engineers need to think, okay, what do we do with this? How do we actually take this R code and uh, integrate it with our Java environment, right? And a lot of uh, uh, people needed to learn first to work together and then uh, understand what are the best tools and uh, uh, what are the best practices. And then usually it happened by trial and error most of the time. Um, but over these five years, I think uh, maybe it took even less time. Um, I think this the trend, like focus uh, on production, I think uh, it's uh, I observed it over the last uh, two three years. Yeah. So, so I remember you arguing about there is nothing called MLOps; it's just DevOps, <laughs> and DevOps is DevOps. <laughs> yeah. So I can talk about does that the, as well, but <laughs> does the practices actually change between MLOps and DevOps? I mean, there are different considerations in my opinion, but I mean, you are better than me by means of software development and infrastructure and serverless stuff. So I feel like we need an expert's opinion. <laughs> if you, so this is just my opinion, right? So this, okay. uh, this is not the, the most popular opinion in the industry right now. So when I write something like that on Twitter, or I especially like You'll doing You'll be this, canceled. Uh, <laughs> so let's say if uh, you know that there is this MLOps community, it's a Slack group. Uh, it's a very yeah. um, active Slack group. So what I like doing there uh, sometimes is just go there and say MLOps is just DevOps or MLOps uh, is overrated. Like, you know, do things like that. And of course, people hate me for that. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think that... Uh, this is some sort of spe specialization. So DevOps uh, existed, has been around for quite a while. Um, and uh, um, so, so the problem DevOps is trying to solve is exactly the same. Um, so previously there was this separation between developers and operations. So developers would develop something and then hand it over to operations. And then they needed to figure out, the ops team needed to figure out what to do with this uh, with this thing, like how do we actually uh, roll it out to production? And then DevOps appeared, people started working together. So there is uh, there are engineers, there are ops uh, uh, engineers, ops people working together in one team uh, on delivering value. So they, from the start, from the very beginning, they focus really on, uh, you know, they do the end-to-end -end thing together. It's not like throwing over the wall thing, but they work together. And uh, MLOps is essentially the same thing, right? Um, I don't know why it's called MLOps. Uh, like you can just call it a feature team or whatever. But I basically, have this book. <laughs> that is okay. basically, in in my opinion, that's basically ML engineering book. I mean, it's not like 
it's it's not that different it tells you how to engineer stuff mm -hmm. i guess i didn't learn much i can say it's nice but i can't say it was the best experience i have ever had with the book it even tells you how to pick your model you know like how, how do you pick your model which one you should pick etc that's pretty much data science in my opinion by the way so i I kind of agree with you. I, I didn't agree you, with you back then, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm kind of an unpopular opinion kind of person, so it's fine. <laughs> but, uh, so actually, uh, like there is a good, uh, very good episode on data tax talks. Uh, sorry for a shameless plug, but there is a podcast episode, and I Just happen go to be ahead. the we will host talk of, about this, <laughs> of this podcast. And I talk about MLOps with my colleague, uh, Theo, uh, who is very passionate about MLOps and he goes really into great details uh, what MLOps is and uh, I, I, I'm I afraid to, to try to, to repeat what he said because I might uh, uh, say something wrong and then he will not like me for that but I definitely recommend checking this uh, uh, so he goes really into details of what MLOps is, why it exists, what are the benefits uh, it brings. Um, Did he convince you? Oh, no, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it, even though even you can argue, we can spend all day arguing if MLOps is the same thing as DevOps or not. But at the end, uh, uh, what matters is uh, uh, like how you approach things. And I think M MLOps really is nailing it. Like you get a team working together uh, on shipping, on delivering uh, machine learning projects and they Everyone works on the same goal, and uh, this is what matters. Right? So it's not like uh, separate teams sitting somewhere, but everyone is together, everyone is aligned, and everyone working on the same goal. And there are also tools that make um, life easier. And then uh, that, like the central component of MLOps is this machine learning platform, and uh, that this is like a piece of infrastructure that allows you to easily uh, deploy models. And this is. Uh, Perhaps this is something that is missing in DevOps. Like there is no such a thing like a machine learning platform. Uh, but to me, again, this is nothing else but a specialization of um, um, DevOps. Like maybe you heard data ops. Uh, this is a similar concept, but it goes uh, more towards data engineering direction than machine learning. Do you engineering. believe in data ops anyway? I, uh, I mean, like. Uh, uh, what matters at the end is not how you call the thing, but uh, that, uh, but the, the goal the team has. And if everyone on the team works towards uh, solving the same goal, then I don't think anything else matters. And uh, uh, a successful team should have, uh, like a successful data team, they should have analysts, they should have uh, data engineers, they should have data scientists, they should have machine learning engineers all working together on the same goal. And then you can call it different ways. I can call it a feature, uh, feature team. And then if there is a machine learning platform that helps them to deliver value faster, that's great. I'm also working in a scale up. And what I do is not MLOps, but I mean, I am basically developing the last part, you know, like the parts where you serve the model and also taking care of the model. But the MLOps part is actually done by the software developer that is developing, you know, the front end, etc. So it's a kind of small company, it's 20 people, I guess. But I, I wouldn't call what I'm doing as MLOps. And uh, people actually confuse it with ML engineering most of the time. They are not. So we met Abdulelah with, uh, on Hugging face sprints. So he he's saying something. MLOps is getting DevOps more hype. That's the same as when happens. What happens with linear regression models when people <laughs> started calling them ML models? Yeah, 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 some people would rather just train a linear regression rather than doing anything else. I saw a meme. Uh, there was this econometric. There is this meme about econometrics people. And uh, they are training linear regression for everything. If you have whatever you have, you can train linear regression. Basically, that's their claim, at least. 
<laughs> so uh, what do you do in OLX? Uh, as lead data scientist, I have never been a lead data scientist, so I really <laughs> wonder. Yes. So, uh, a lead data scientist at Elix means uh, so this is I'm not like a team lead. Uh, so, for team lead, uh, so like we call this position uh, a manager, a data science manager. So, what a lead uh, is is it's a, a role after a senior. So you have like a junior data scientist, you have a middle level data scientist, you have a senior data scientist, and then there is a lead. So this is what we call the individual contributor track. So this is simply the role after senior. And what I do as a lead is uh, quite a few things. So um, first I uh, try to help people. So if there is any problem with uh, machine learning or infrastructure, uh, I am always happy to help. And I'm also doing a lot of mentoring, uh, working with people, uh, like, well, let's say have some sort of uh, um, like setting goals and then meeting every week uh, to discuss how we are moving towards solving these uh, things and then what are the problems and things like that. Um, so typically these are people who are not data scientists yet but want to become ones, one, or data scientists, like data analysts or engineers and then we, I, I am there to help them to, to move. So that's one of the things like mentoring, helping uh, helping others. Then other thing is I um, try to um, uh, so like this uh, the, the infrastructure component, like uh, designing uh, architecture, like systems. Let's say we, we have a new project, and we want to understand how it's better to design this project. What are the components? How the data is uh, flowing there through the system? What should we store? What kind of systems to use? Uh, how to deploy all these things and uh, this is one of the things I also sometimes do like uh, uh, defining all these components and then um, the um, yeah speaking of infrastructure one of the things one of the main projects I'm working on right now is uh, designing a machine learning platform so this is the thing we briefly talked about um, uh, like this is in MLOps this is like the central uh, tool that uh, uh, teams have to be able to deploy models faster and uh, this is one of the tools uh, uh, one of the things uh, I am uh, um, I don't know if I can say leading because I'm not the only one there but uh, this is one of the projects uh, uh, I'm taking part in uh, building this uh, machine learning platform. So first, understanding what kind of use cases we have across the uh, across the, uh, the company, across OLX, and then seeing what are the problems we have um, when deploying this, and then trying to solve these problems with uh, this platform. So basically, building uh, this tool to make uh, the life of data scientists easier. And then there there are like a couple of other things, like for example, creating prototypes. Let's say we want to develop a new project but it's not clear if this project is valuable or not, then I would uh, implement a proof of concept, understand that uh, this is actually valuable or not, and if it is, then we can spend uh, I don't know, one or two quarters trying to implement that. Yeah, that's, uh, I guess, this is what I do. You do a lot of stuff. I would call it ML engineering. There is this separate title that I don't know where it came from, and I don't know the difference between data scientists. I think that companies also don't know about what is the difference, but I guess, I mean, you kind of engineer it, you know, deploy stuff and I don't know, do some infrastructure work. So yeah, yeah that data probably scientists, would be, yeah. yeah, go on. Yeah, that would be probably a more correct uh, uh, description of what I do. Uh, like a machine learning engineer. And I can briefly mention what I think is the difference between the data scientist uh, role and machine learning engineer, if you're interested. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, so the, the data scientist focuses on uh, more on the modeling side and the engineer, the machine learning engineer focuses more on uh, uh, getting this model and scaling this up. So it's not like a, just a flask up. Uh, data scientists typically um, can. Um, the, we expect, for example, at Elix, we expect data scientists to be able to 
put their model inside a fast cap and package this in Docker. Uh, but then after that, uh, ML engineers um, help. They work together with data scientists to be able uh, to, to, to deploy this model. So it works reliably. There are metrics. Uh, it scales up and down. Uh, doesn't fail, all these things. And uh, these are typically machine learning engineers. And they they also should know uh, machine learning because they need, they need to speak the same language with data scientists and ask, for example, do you really need this feature? Because this feature is really uh, difficult to compute. What happens if we remove this feature, right? Um, they should also be able to uh, create a simple prototype rather fast. I don't know, take some data, train logistic regression or linear regression, see that uh, there is some value and then uh, put this in production. Yeah, that, uh, I that's my it. understanding. I get it. And uh, I would like to ask you, uh, as your Kaggle career, uh, how did you become a Kaggle master? And like, what do you do? I mean, I want to start to do Kaggling, but I'm kind of intimidated. And um, I don't know where to start, to be honest. I'm just, what I do is like, I have this uh, weekly Twitch streams. And during these weekly Twitch streams, I basically code on Kaggle so people can actually like, just come and see the notebook. That's my relationship with Kaggle. That is literally <laughs> minimal, on a minimal level. And I don't know how to compete. So like, how does a workflow begin and end with competing? Yeah, so uh, maybe my advice is a bit outdated because uh, I'm not an active uh, Kaggler anymore. So once I got my master's, I kind of uh, master, I mean, Kaggle master, then I thought, okay, this is enough for me. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is too much <laughs> because it does require a lot of effort. And then Kaggle, it, like Kaggle is evolving constantly. So things uh, are changing there. And when I started, uh, like uh, uh, there was no uh, notebooks. I think they just appeared. Mostly people were sharing scripts in uh, discussion. And then there was no separate model, um, like separate uh, tier for discussions. I think it appeared when I already started uh, participating in Kaggle. And now I think the competitions that uh, you have there on Kaggle, they're quite different because when I was there, it was mostly tabular data. Now it's more, at least this is my impression. Now there are more yeah, images. Yeah, there are different domains. So they're, 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 uh, my impression is that the competitions are more challenging and also more people know about Kaggle now. So every data scientist, every aspiring data scientist now knows about Kaggle. And the first thing they do when they want to learn something is that they go to Kaggle and try to compete, in, to compete there. Well, maybe not everyone, but at least some people do and now like for every competition i think instead of uh, like a competition when i got my uh, kaggle master it had only 1000 uh, participants but now if you go to a competition there would be five or six or even 10000 so it's uh, a lot more participants now but uh, what helped me and i spent uh, uh, six or maybe eight months actively uh, uh, like on kaggle uh, so I remember my first competition, um, uh, I, I was very, uh, like I thought, okay, I know machine learning really well, well, really well, because I had been studying machine learning for two years. I got my master's degree. I know this, all this theory really well. I can derive, I don't know, SVM or whatnot. So I thought, okay, now I go to Kaggle and then I'll nail it. Like with my first submission, I will get to the top because I know all these things, right? <laughs> and then the reality was that all my knowledge, everything I learned from university, um, even during my, uh, I was doing a bit of freelancing, even during freelancing, it was so useless. I couldn't do a thing. Yeah. Like I was, uh, my first submission was somewhere at the bottom. And then I thought, okay, like, uh, <laughs> it was uh, an eye opener for me. Like, I just understood that uh, I don't know anything. And that kind of helped me, that motivated me to, uh, okay, I don't know anything, but uh, like, how do actually people compete here? Like, what are these people on the top? What do they do? And then Kaggle is such an amazing community that they share everything. Like there are discussion threads, people share what is working, what is not working. They are sharing 
papers, their shared, sharing approaches, uh, different feature engineering things, the uh, tips, like there are all these notebooks with uh, like a walkthrough. And then um, this is how I started. So I started looking at what others do, trying to reproduce it, trying to understand what is going on there and then improve it a little bit. And then- At um, school, at school mostly doesn't work. I, this week uh, we had this decision tree learning topic at machine learning class. Last week we saw concept learning, which is like kind of an outdated and not so machine learning kind of approach in my opinion. And I asked to the lecturer, you know, like, um, won't you, won't you teach ensembles? Won't you teach, you know, like XGBoost whatsoever? And he was like, no, you just need to learn the basics. And like, there are not so many people that actually know Kaggle. I don't know. There are people who don't know how to Kaggle or like maybe people thinking that they can just become an ultimate data scientist just by going to a master's, I guess, just like your naive old self. <laughs> so, I mean, I was like, these are the state of art things that are used in companies. And he was like, no, yeah, I'm not going to, sh I'm not going to do that because like, it's hard to catch up with the state of art and we can't cover all of these. And I was like, okay. He was like, you got the basics. You can just expand it and do your own thing if you want. Yeah, maybe it's actually a good advice to to yeah. focus on basics. And uh, but what I, I mean, was yes, was different. totally. I mean, totally because most people don't even know the basics. They just go from the advanced side without knowing basic problems because some of the basic problems actually stay with you, stay with you, like stuff that I learned at the school, some of them are still not solved. Some of them are solved, but like, if you know the basics, they always stick with you somehow. Also, you know, data structures, algorithms, and other stuff, which are basically asked in interviews, but I would also like to learn about how the ensembles learn and its mathematics at the school. Well, I guess I will just do it myself. Yeah, yeah the, the funny thing is, uh, in my opinion, to yeah. successfully compete on Kaggle, you do not need to know all this mathematics behind, uh, I don't know, XGBoost. What you need to know is how to tune XGBoost. And even before that, even yeah. before like, uh, even before XGBoost, there is the very, like the, the most important step. And I think uh, this is like the, the, one of the things that Kaggle really teaches you to do well is how do you set up cross-validation? Like how to, <laughs> how to make sure that whatever you do in your uh, local environment, laptop or I don't know, cloud, whatever, it correlates with the leaderboard. And that requires thinking really uh, carefully about the way you design your validation framework. Like how you do, like how you, you are make sure that you are not overfitting. And this is, uh, okay, you can hear many bad things about Kaggle, like that it doesn't teach you, like the, the things you learn at Kaggle do not, uh, translate to real world, uh, all these ensembles, uh, maybe. But one thing that Kaggle really teaches you to do is that, like setting up your validation framework. And this, I think, this is really important. And once you have that, then you start learning how to tune your models, like how to tune XGBoost, like all this, because this is, uh, this is a really complex model. There are so many knobs that you can uh, uh, try to tune to achieve the best performance, right? And that it requires a lot of trials and errors. But the thing is, in my opinion, you don't really need to know like all these derivatives in functional space and uh, whatever you, like when you read a paper about gradient boosted uh, trees, like all these difficult derivations, you don't need all of that. You just need to know how to tune XGBoost. boost. And typically you learn this by reading forums. So on Kaggle, there are discussions uh, there are examples like this is how I tune XGBoost model. And uh, this has happened to me. I saw that, okay, this person is uh, sharing this algorithm to, of tuning the model. So I would try and reproduce this. And then, okay, like, I think I can improve this. And then I start experimenting and say, okay, actually like this approach that I developed based on what was suggested in uh, forums, 
works better for me because I understand it more. Like for me, it's more uh, I don't know relatable or whatever. And this is how you learn. So you learn by doing, and then again, the most important thing you have this cross validation set up that uh, you can test everything locally. So you don't need to every time you experiment, every time you time you you try to change something, you don't need to submit it to Kaggle on the leaderboard because you have a cross validation uh, framework set up for you that uh, you basically you know you can trust it, and then this is the most important thing. And then of course, what happens next? Uh, you train thousands of different models, and then you combine them, and then to to get to the top. So this is uh, this is where Kaggle deviates from the, the real life. So all these ensembles they um, uh, they are not super useful in reality. Uh, but this is what you have to do if you want to get on the top. And this is what I also did in uh, one of my last competitions to actually get to this um, to top. Uh, I think I was in uh, our team was in fifth position. Like to get there, of course, we needed to do ensembles. Uh, and uh, like for me, actually, this competition, I spent three months doing that. So from the very beginning, when it was announced till the very end, every day doing something. So this is a lot of hard work. And uh, at some point, I was doing it. Uh, I don't know, five hours per day. That's just a lot, and then that's uh, too much. Yes. What What did you even do to improve? I mean, did you just do grid search, cross validation, or whatever search? I don't know. Uh, talking to people mostly, and then uh, um, hanging out on uh, forums and uh, trying to okay. get uh, bits of information from others. Like, hey, did you try that? Did it work? Uh, and then every uh, now and then, somebody would come and say, "Hey, this is." This is the paper I implemented, and it worked. And then I would spend a couple of days trying to implement this paper, uh, or re like implement some idea that somebody shared, only to find out that it doesn't really work for me. <laughs> but that was fun, <laughs> but uh, uh -huh. also too much. <laughs> How much percent does your uh, final model differ from the first thing you got? Does uh, it differ it, that it, much? No. Like uh, I know, right? <laughs> like I, I don't know, like uh, one, one or two decimal points. But yeah, so this is the price you have that to pay like, if you, you want to get a medal. But I mean, that makes you win a challenge, so that's <laughs> fine, I guess. I mean, when I was, I was working for, I, I was working as a predictive analytics kind of data scientist before, and also doing chatbots in my previous job, and I was doing, I mean. I thought Kaggle people were actually doing, you know, tons of stacks together and like there is a neural network and there is XGBoost and there's some other gigantic models stacked together and advanced stuff doing feature eliminations and other things and voila. But I guess it's just grid search with cross validation and XGBoost. Oh. I which wouldn't. which was my job actually like <laughs> i was doing the same thing on my job and mm -hmm. it it wouldn't increase that much through the search so it it's just one or two percent so i guess those stuff actually make you win things i wouldn't yeah. say it's about grid search i would say it's about uh, like smart feature engineering uh, yeah. and then uh, usually like uh, a nice feature gives you a lot more than uh, tuning. But then uh, when you have a lot of nice features, then of course you need to start tuning because the other teams who are on the top, they also have these nice features, but they also can tune it to boost. And then this is when you need to. And this is, uh, I wouldn't say it's a um, grid search. It's more like um, you still need a human, like somebody who, who, who would know like how to tune, uh, to like how to adjust these knobs. If you want to get really good performance, how do you how do you search for optimal hyperparameters, though? Oh, okay, I haven't done that for for a while. So, well, uh, let me try to remember. So, the first thing you do uh, in XGBoost is uh, you need to find the optimal uh, depth. So, what I would do is first I would start with the default parameters, and that the XGBoost has, and the default parameter is six, I think, like the, the depth, and th then I would try. I don't know, three, then I would try 10 and see which direction is better. That's literally what I was doing, by the way. And I feel like it's not intimidating anymore. 
Yes, so, and then yes, yeah, so then after that there is uh, like okay, you found the, the best uh, depth parameter, right? And then you try the next thing, and uh, yeah, what was that? Uh, well, you try experimenting with sample the the size of the the, the leaf, then um, yeah, what else? Uh, and then at the end, somewhere at the end, I tune this um, learning rate parameter. So basically, I uh, I start with the default learning rate, and then I make it ten times smaller, and then I would throw ten times more trees there, and then typically it's better. Uh, but yeah, I to be honest, I forgot all these tricks uh, because uh, like if I if I want to train an XGBoost model right now, uh, yeah, I would do something simple. I would go with a small model with a big learning rate, uh, with uh, fewer trees that would give me reasonably good performance. And I would just open that because there are so many other things that we need to do, like to actually ship this model to production. That uh, you know, this one extra percent usually doesn't matter at least at the beginning. I get it. It's it's not intimidating anymore, I guess. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> I will start kaggling on June. I have put it to myself. I'm going to get over my finals and just try mm -hmm. it, and I will ping you if I can't get anywhere. Of course. <laughs> so uh, I want to talk about your book, if that's also OK for you. Of course. My impression from your book is that it's, it is good for people trying to get a place in industry, mostly, but also you know, beginner to intermediate, maybe a bit more in intermediate level. It has production in it. It has a little bit of science. It's fine. I liked it a lot. Uh, I, as a person who is not uh, developing that much, there there is so many things in it, like AWS and Kubernetes. And you also have used, uh, you, you are basically showing everything. Like you have shown SciPy, NumPy, all of the Pi data stack, TensorFlow Keras, Scikit-Learn. I mean, I really liked your book, uh, but like, how did you come up with the book? This yeah. is my question. So uh, the idea is, um, so it also goes back to, uh, first of all, I'm a software engineer. Mm -hmm. And when I started doing Kaggle, this is when I realized that I learn best by doing projects. So like for me, working on like having a problem that I needed to solve works a lot better than, uh, you know, uh, just some something abstract that I need to, I don't know, derive on paper. Uh, so this is how uh, machine learning happened at my university where I studied. So first we would learn a lot of theory and then at the end there would be practice where we would uh, take some toy data set either generated or MNIST or IRIS, and then try to apply this model on that. And that was the all the practical part. But Kaggle is different, right? So on Kaggle, you have a problem that you need to solve. And this is when I really learned how to do machine learning. And I thought, if this is, so this project-based approach really worked well for me. And I thought that uh, this is what I should try to do in the book. So instead of, um, you know, theory first and practice, I focus on projects. So there is a project that you need to solve. Uh, let's say in the second chapter, um, the problem we need to solve is predicting the price of a car. So this is the problem. This is the business sentence. So let's say we work uh, in online classifieds and somebody wants to sell a car and we want to help this person to select the best price. So here's the problem. And then we go through this uh, problem, we find a data set, we look at this data set, we prepare this, and then do um, everything we need, uh, just enough to solve this problem. So we don't go um, and... Uh, so what I'm trying to say is we really focus on solving this problem. And we learn just enough to solve this problem. And then we go to the next chapter, the, the problem is different. And the problem there is churn prediction, which is... a uh, uh, binary classification problem and we use uh, logistic regression and then again we learn just enough to uh, do the necessary feature preprocessing feature engineering uh, for example convert categorical variables to 
uh, to numerical or using one hot encoding and things like that. Then you have a model and then um, the next chapter is, okay, we have this model, how do we actually evaluate it? And then we learn just enough to to be able to judge if the model is good enough or not, like all these things like precision, recall, um, and all that. And then the next chapter is, now we have a model that we trained, we evaluated it, now it's time that we deploy this model. And then we really focus on, uh, on deploying this. So this is like an end-to-end -end process from the from understanding setting the business context to actually deploying this problem this uh, model to aws and for me this is was how this was for me how i learned best and i thought that there are many other software engineers who want to make a similar transition who will appreciate this way of uh, uh, teaching this way of conveying information and this is how it appeared and uh, to be honest this is not my first book that follows this project-based approach uh, I co-authored um, a couple of years ago a book about TensorFlow. It was called TensorFlow Projects, where it was about implementing like, I don't know, 10 different projects in TensorFlow. And I really like this approach when you have, uh, like you have a project and you just focus on solving this. And this is how uh, this book appeared. I wanted to, to follow a similar one, um, but do this end to end. I feel like, um that's incredibly valuable is is that the word that's 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 something hard to find because there are all, so many online courses out there you know teaching abstract stuff but nobody actually teach teaches you how to do a project and in the end i feel like what matters is that you know you have taken this course that course that i feel like that doesn't matter a lot uh, what matters is that but whatever you have learned from them and if you could put a project uh, from it, you know, like scraping your own data or like yeah. just getting another data set and just doing an open source project and actually, um, actually put it on put it on somewhere so that you can actually show the employers if you don't have any PhD, if you don't have any uh, job uh, experience, I feel like the best way to do, best way to get hired is that uh, just do some open source projects and just put your GitHub link or like Kaggle link on your CV and then that's the best way because that's what the, the employer can actually judge the fact that you can do whatever they require so that's actually very valuable that you have put this uh you have written this book in my opinion because not many people actually teach you how to do a project and that's that's what matters rather than just you know phds and other stuff which is like not so many people can accomplish in my opinion phd literally re requires a lot of patience and uh, there were many senior machine learning engineer um, job uh, opportunities, but there wasn't much for junior or inexperienced. So projects actually are a very good approach, in my opinion. And I, you have also shown how to put them to production, which is also there are not much um, sources out there on you know how you, you can serve your model. What is the best way of serving your model actually safe and scalable and secure? So this is also another thing. So I, I, I can't wait to, you know, like do projects in your book. <laughs> also, oh. we are giving away today. <laughs> uh, so can you also, uh, some people asked about what kind of events are there in Data Talk Society. So can you also talk about <laughs> it? Yeah. Well, uh, I, first, may, maybe I just wanted to add a few words about uh, the book before we go to Yeah, that. yeah, sure. So one thing you mentioned, uh, like in a secure way, and actually I just wanted to correct you that uh, this is not the focus of the book. So the focus is really like on deploying. But this is not always the most secure way. So you, like, if you want to take things that you learn from the book and directly apply to production environment, first consult your operational team. Okay. Uh, 
because uh, like this is not possible to fit so much like because there is much more than just you know deploying a flask application there are many things like networking and that are beyond the scope uh, like, of the book so yeah so you you need to know what you're doing and it's best if there is uh, um, somebody experienced uh, that can help you and i'm talking about uh, uh, industrial settings like when you are working at the company and want to, to, to deploy something you need to be careful but for pet projects uh, of course nobody's going to hack uh, you and if they are well, what can they, they get from that then other thing i wanted to mention is um, even though the book is project based it's not enough just to follow the book just take it uh, chapter 2 implemented chapter 3 implemented uh, chapter 10 implemented and then be happy about this this is not enough right so if you do that this you might get a sense a false sense of uh, that you learned uh, a lot but when you try to um, approach a project that is slightly different then maybe some things are not in the book and then uh, you know you need to be uh, uh, obviously careful and for that for that the important thing is that at the end of the each chapter there are exercises that you are supposed to do yourself based on what you just learned in the book in the chapter and then the exercises are just to dig deeper in some of the topics by yourself or exercises that here's a project that is similar maybe it's only a tiny bit uh, uh, not similar like different and implement that project and if you do that then nothing will stop you but don't just follow along um, that might create a false sense of uh, uh, knowing everything like it was the case for me I thought I know everything but when I tried Kaggle I failed miserably so try I to mean, do projects as early as possible by yourself yeah this is this is a word that is actually trying to get started I guess because like we all have Im imposter syndrome mm -hmm. at some point <laughs> especially me i have a i have a gigantic one so um can so you talk about talks. data talks <laughs> yeah. uh yeah so data talks is a community of people who love data and uh, we host weekly events so like if you want to know what kind of events are there you just go to datatalks.club and there is a, a section on the website with events uh, so I can briefly tell you that we has we host two types of events. So one is more technical event uh, kinds of events which we do on Tuesdays. There is a presentation uh, which goes into uh, maybe some some machine learning concept or I don't know deep learning concept or perhaps uh, a use case or some technology, and it's. Uh, like there is a presentation and then Q&A, like the typical presentation you would have or like on a meetup. And then we have a different kind of event on Friday, which is like that, uh, what we have right now, like a podcast where we talk about different topics, but I usually ask questions, not answer. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then uh, the audience sometimes jumps in and asks things. So definitely check uh, our website and somebody is asking if it's uh, a discord server it's not it's uh it's a slack there's a slack yes uh, but yeah let me post can i send an invitation oh um, yes you I can but like, uh, so you have the url so you you just go there you put your email in the uh like there's a special field there you just put your email there you click the join button and then you get an email with uh, inviting i copy the share link i guess this works yeah let's hope it does thanks i also like really like your podcasts yeah thank you i mean uh Mine are kind of starter right now. I don't know where it goes. I'm just doing it to um, unwind. That's is that the right word? I don't know. It's just good for relaxation and you know talking to someone you can relate because in COVID it's impossible to socialize with the people like you. So yeah, uh, who are you hosting next? Well, uh, 
I just wanted to say that I'm not that far ahead of you. So because I started <laughs> only November, so just a few months ago. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> not that uh, far away. So the next one is a special guest who is uh, uh, maybe some of you know. Uh, he is the one of the admins of uh, MLOps community, Demetrius, and mm -hmm. we will be talking about online communities. I thought you would be talking about how MLOps doesn't exist. No, uh, maybe I'll try to tease him, uh, but he's not, uh, <laughs> like he doesn't uh, he doesn't react in a way I want people to react when I <laughs> say that. <laughs> so I want to uh, ah no, you are not right, so you're wrong, and here are the reasons why you're not right. Uh, but he's not like that, so it's, uh, I, I don't pull this on him. I'm gonna host Vincent next week. You know Vincent, right? Ah, yes. Vincent uh, Varmerdam. Yeah, yeah. So he, I'm he's... also I'm also in the community of Raza because I mean I'm doing chat spots in most of my as 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 my job I'm developing NLP tools and chat bots. So I also contributed to get um, Raza, not Kaggle, Raza. So we met and uh he's he's an awesome person and we will be talking Jeez, about yes. how they are getting rid of intents and stuff he has cool videos so stay tuned so um yeah thank you a lot for coming today i really enjoyed our talk <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe we can maybe we can have a repeat session in a year or something that would yeah. be awesome that would be indeed awesome uh, as far as, as I remember, you wanted to give away some copies of the book. Yes, I'm going to do it after the after the episode. Oh, okay. So, yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. I will see you again. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Goodbye.